Welcome everybody to Drive to Win. I'm Justin Bell and the show presented by the Win Las Vegas and brought to you by Mobile One for the love of driving. I'm Justin Bell and I couldn't be more excited to be here because it is as Brian and Jeremiah who are behind that wall behind me in the production room have just told me it is a year since we did our first show. Wow. Over 33 shows so far all about Formula One. I can't believe we made it. It's very, very exciting. Now, a big week in the world of motorsport coming off the back of the Italian Grand Prix at Imola, and this weekend looking forward to the Monaco Grand Prix, as well as the Indy 500, which is why I have a very special guest, Dario Franchitti. Yes, he's a Scot with an Italian name, very confusing to a Brit, but he is going to be joining us, and I can't wait to talk about it all. But I don't know about you, but coming on Sunday, watching the Italian Grand Prix, I was so full of optimism, excitement, anticipation, because I love watching the cars drive around there. They're so on the edge, literally at the threshold of physics. And it must be so exciting to drive as, you know, as one of those Formula One drivers. But it turned out to be an absolute bore fest of a race for about 85% of it. I was, <laughs> it reminded me, to be honest, of the, the races in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, when it was just a procession. So I always watch the race on, on, my, on my phone, casting it to my smart TV on the Formula One app, which I really love. I love Alec Jack and the way David Coulthard and the way they present it. But it means you can go mobile, right? And when the race is dull, I go mobile. I went into the kitchen to, to make some coffee. And suddenly I noticed Lando's gap to Max was shrinking. So I was like, I think I need to pay a bit more attention. So I went back, put it on the big TV. And of course, uh, we'll get into that in a minute, but it ended up being a very close, very exciting finish. Imola for Ferrari and for the Tifosi, which is the Ferrari fans, is such a, a pilgrimage, a, a hugely historic racetrack to go to. Monza is more the spiritual home for Ferrari. It's closer, but Imola is only relatively just down the road. And the Ferrari fans have so much to get excited about this year. You could tell, uh, I mean, it's just to see a throng. It's very like when you go to Holland, to the, to the Netherlands, and you watch the everyone in orange for, for Max. Well, you go to, to, uh, to watch the Italian Grand Prix, and it's just jammed with red. So I was very excited. I could feel the palpable energy of, of everything. But, uh, you know, when you think about it, why was that a, such a, a, a sort of dull race? Well, the podium, as we know, went Max Lando Leclerc, which was, you know, a, a very strong result. But that is, there's so much more to tell than that. And the headlines really just don't tell the full story. But before we dive into the race, there were a couple of really nice moments. And I know we talked about it a bit on last week's show. Going into the 30th anniversary of Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger's death, death at Imola was obviously a mantle that weighed heavy on everybody. Ayrton Senna was our hero. He was the Michael Jordan of, of every generation of Formula One. And the fact that he, it was 30 years ago he died, I think took all of us back, anyone that was a Formula One fan, anyone that's been a driver, it just took you back, transported you to a, it was a time when he was an epic hero of our sport. When they really was no social media at all to speak of. It was done the old fashioned way, print media and, and television broadcast. So it shows how famous he was. And just to have that wonderful poignant moment when Sebastian Vettel drove that ex Senna McLaren MP4-8, uh, which was the last race he won of his 41 victories was in that car. And to see Sebastian Vettel do those laps. It, and I just read uh, uh, the book about that weekend, one, another book about that weekend. And after Roland died on the Friday, they carried, on the Saturday rather, it turned out they, that uh, Senna was carrying a fold up Austrian flag inside his race suit, which he intended to, you know, proudly wave from the cockpit after he had won the race on Sunday. Sadly, that never happened. And the flag was found, you know, when the nurses took off his race suit. So, I mean, what a moment. So Sebastian Vettel driving the car, you could feel 
the the energy from him, and he was in tears. I know when that happens. So really great, and he he is he is proving to be an extraordinary ambassador for motorsports for the the human side of motorsport and the uh, not just the technical, which he is doing with all his alternative fuels, but the fact that he galvanized the F2 drivers, the F1 drivers, nearly every single, ever, well, it wasn't nearly, every single driver was there wearing these yellow shirts they had had made with the family to run around the track and they stopped for a moment at uh, the Tamburello curves. And I mean, it was just, I mean, wonderful. What a moment to be there. Uh, and really also important that Roland Ratzenberger had, the Austrian had some incredible tributes about him too. Uh, I mean, a terrible thing to pass, to die tragically on the same, uh, you know, on your own, but then make it the same weekend as Ed and Senna. Uh, I guess he'll forever be remembered. Another thing on the flip side, the fresh side, the the optimistic side of our sport was seeing Oli Beerman, uh, Oliver Beerman back for an FP1 outing with Haas on Friday. Remember, he was seventh in that race with Ferrari, his first ever time the youngest ever, you know, Formula One driver for Ferrari, uh, but he's had to go back to F2. So he must be jumping back and forth. And I, I know that he must be so ready to jump back into either the Haas or, or Ferrari. Uh, and why would he get in the Haas? Well, if imagine Kevin Magnussen gets another, gets his one race ban, then you'd have to put someone like Oli in. So, you know, just imagine the excitement that a kid like that has got watching this from the sidelines, knowing he can get in. Although the demands of getting into F2 can't can't be too easy in and out of the cars. Race standouts for me. I mean, I'm going to dive into it with Dario. I think uh, you know, I listened to a couple of my peers, go, even the Autosport podcast and the race podcast. They didn't really have much to say about the race, uh, but it was the way it got tense at the end was a series of events that that really came together because. When it's so dull, it's really because the tires are performing in their window. No one is really being upset by by anything. The tire deg was was it was just very solid in the middle of the race. But uh, it did make me think about what we talked about last week, which was do the harder tires create better racing when there's less grip traction? You know, the threshold of grip is less in a Formula One car with the harder tires. I definitely think that might be a way forward, and I'm sure everybody at Pirelli and F1 is is looking at that. Now, this track is Imola is so tough to overtake on, but drivers love love driving there on a single lap. Um, it's always been that way. So, of course, when the tire day got worse and Max is out front, I, I I'm sure like me, you just went, okay, he's he's cleared off into the trees. But what really happened was, remember, he'd had such a struggle all weekend with the balance of car. And we can dive into that again with with Dario. But they got it right for the race. But, you know, when his tires went off, the front tires went ran out of tread. They lost, which obviously he meant he lost a bit of pace, which means the temperatures went down. And at that point, the race was on. And just Lando, who had managed his tires better up to that point, was able not just to, to, to uh, benefit from Max's pace, but actually he was able to improve on it and push harder all the way to the end of the race. And it was jolly exciting. Now, of course, Max, it wasn't an easy weekend in any way. And it, it was an absolute crappy weekend until they they got the development over the week, over the Friday night in the in the sim back at the factory. Um, snatching pole by getting a little bit of a toe. Uh, but he had to use every bit of his race, race craft to, to keep that win. So, I mean, really an excellent race. And he even had the capacity, guys, to race from his motorhome for his sim team in the virtual Nurburgring 24 hours, which he won as well. So an amazing feat. And his win percentage is now at like 30.7%, which he just overtook uh, Lewis Hamilton on. Extraordinary. So I left the race thinking, is the gap to Red Bull really gone down that much? Is this what we're going to see for the rest of the race, the rest of the season? And maybe over the, the long run, it isn't what we're going to see uh, because I think the Red Bull's capacity to stay on top right now with Max as the X Factor is is definitely a part of it. But based on the recent upgrades and everything that McLaren are bringing and Ferrari are bringing, it's definitely putting Red Bull under pressure. So we, we're going to see way more of this. And I mean, let's talk about McLaren because they made this massive step forward. And yes, uh, they are the... Uh, you know, they are, what do you call it, when they they disturb the force, so to speak. And they really are creating an upset and putting pressure on. 
So I really do think that you're going to see McLaren right now. I said it last week, Lando is, is definitely uh, a guy who has now worked out how to win. Uh, remember, he won and everything else he did, so it's not that much of a shock. But he really managed those tires. And when he reduced that gap and we were watching, how often have you been able to say Max is being caught? So I think it really is a, a sign of the times. And the qualifying pace from the McLarens, and that is one of the things, watching Oscar Piastri's pace, he did get that penalty that knocked him back to fifth. But it should have really been a McLaren front row lockout. And this time last year, there's no way, when we had Zach Brown on our first show, would he have been able to predict, and he could have anticipated, but would he have been able to predict that they would have been there at this point of the year? I, I think Oscar's going to come alive as well. He must really want to prove his point in the team, and he's bloody fast. But I don't think his time management is as mature yet. But we'll see when he does. He certainly will. Ferrari, I mean, it's home. They're surrounded by the culture of Ferrari. Uh, and finishing third and fifth, but not second, must have been a little bit of a pain. And, I mean, they led free practice one. They led free practice two with Charles Leclerc. They, they really were probably thinking, this is our weekend. This is the weekend that we're going to crack it. And as Fred Vesser said afterwards, we're so motivated as the gap is so close. And, but what they need to do is have a faster development from, it's a, really a faster process from innovation in the, whether it's the wind tunnel with the sim, uh, you know, bringing these upgrades, they've got to have a faster bringing to market process, so to speak, just like their competitors. But it wouldn't take much for them to be on top. I, I think everybody over the weekend was shocked and dismayed really at uh, Sergio Perez's performance over the weekend. I mean, in the race, I mean, he this is the third time he's been off the podium uh, this year. And in the race, it's like he didn't even put up a fight when everyone came by. And the commentators and were, you know, making, <laughs> making comment on it. They were watching him basically not even defend his line. So I have no clue what must go on in his helmet. Uh, and it was maybe more noticeable this weekend because Max was the difference when it counted and he wasn't. So, I mean, he finished a minute behind Max in the race and I'd say that his replacement is already being lined up. I, I think if the inconsistency continues, there's no way you can justify him being in the car. And I'm not just kind of, you know, dumping on his head, but uh, we've said it all along. He, he cannot lose the manufacturer's points for them and he will you know second place in the championship he's got to be what he gets but right now uh, I don't think that is and you know then you go into the conversation once again of who's going to take his place Yuki Sonoda I mean he's doing really well but it's his fourth year he's outperforming Daniel Ricca Ricardo but in no way do I see him getting that Red Bull seat it's just not going to happen uh, he should probably stay where he is and that's the best alternative for him so either they're going to hold Perez in place or I think they should go for Carlos Sainz. I would love that. Would you love that? I would love that. Uh, some other funny gossip from the weekend. Ten-time race winner and a two-time guest on Drive to Win, uh, Valtteri Bottas was seen for, in the Williams motorhome for coffee, uh, which isn't such a stupid move if you think him partnering with Albon would really bring a maturity and help Albon maybe flower and grow to the levels of performance that we know that he can really reach with all that technical knowledge as well and a good energy. So uh, at the same time, we had Carlos Sainz in the Red Bull and Alpine motorhomes over the weekend. It's a lot of coffee. They must love coffee. A lot can happen in the next week for sure. So I, I'm really looking forward to the Indy 500 and Monaco this weekend. So the Las Vegas Concours is back for 2024, and it's definitely one of the world's most prestigious automotive events, taking place November 1st through the 3rd at the Wynn Golf Club, right here at the Wynn Las Vegas. It's a one-of-a-kind, mesmerizing, immersive experience. The Las Vegas Concours is an exhibition featuring more than 250 distinctive automobiles from around the world, paying homage to remarkable cars of the past, present, and some very cool cars from the future. A celebration of heritage, craftsmanship, and innovation, the Las Vegas Concours at Win Las Vegas brings car enthusiasts from all corners of the globe to revel in automotive excellence, all, of course, set against the dynamic backdrop of the Las Vegas Strip. 
And who will you find emceeing and hosting the event? Out there on stage, doling out the heavy hardware to this year's winner? Well, of course, it's me. So come and say hi this November. For more information regarding recently added rooms and packages, you can visit lasvegasconcord.com. That's it, lasvegasconcord.com. But let's jump on now with our superstar guest, four times IndyCar champion, three-time Indy 500 winner. He is a TV commentator with amazing hair. And like I said, I, I grew up thinking, Dario Franchitti, but hold on, Italian, Scottish, and he, uh, he represents the, his nation very well. Well, Dario, finally, I'm very excited to say welcome to Drive to Win. Thank you. I'm slightly nervous. I don't know why. You're nervous with me. Do you know what it is? It's because you know these things, when it comes to a conversation with me, can take a sharp 90-degree turn into a ditch. <laughs> um, and you've also spent yeah, enough exactly time right. with me. You spent enough time with me socially to know my disturbingly bad behavior, which is not going to be present today. And you also know where all the bodies are buried, which is mm -hmm. slightly worrying. I know, uh, our mutual mm -hmm. friends. Um, well, you're in Indy. I know you've got a lot going on there. I want to come back to the Indy 500. You're, you're obviously playing a, a big role there. But you, how many days have you been there? And what are you actually doing? So I showed up on the 8th for the Grand Prix and I've been there ever since 8th of May and I work with Chip Ganassi Racing um, from the day I basically stopped. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an advisor for the team. So I work with you know, Scott Dixon, Alex Pillow, trying to just get marginal gains for them um, any weekend, especially at the Indy 500. But then we've got three rookies in the team, Kiffin Simpson, Linus Lundquist and Marcus Armstrong. And it's... Uh, the 500 for them is a bit more sort of drinking out of a fire hose. So we're just trying to get them into the rhythm, shortcut um, some of the mistakes that certainly I made and most rookies seem to make there. And um, yeah, put on the best show we possibly can on, on Sunday. I mean, what an interesting position because you with all your experience, all your wins there and all your failures there, I mean, that's as much a part of, of being a racing driver, right? So you have these rookies where you, you're having to literally nurture them on and say what the start's going to be like, what to, how to pace themselves. And then you've got Scott, who, I mean, that's a bit like trying to teach Michael Jordan, you know, how to dunk. I mean, you, you've got to find the minuscule gains on one end and massive gains on the other. That's quite an interesting perspective. Yeah, it is absolutely. With as you say with Scott, it's sort of you know if we do this, if you look at that, you know you're watching all the data and videos, and we're, we're just trying to find these minuscule gains. But then, I literally, my conversation with Marcus Armstrong was, "Oh yeah, when you come down to take the start, you're going to lift off the throttle because you're in turbulence, and the car's not going to stop. The car's going to keep accelerating because there's so much disturbed air in front of you, and you're going to try and press the brakes, and that's going to mess up the balance of the car." So you know, it's um, these are very talented drivers that have got to this point, but the Indy 500, the, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, is like no track they've ever raced on, and like no event. So we're just trying to to help them out as as much as possible. Wow. Well, we'll jump back at the end just to a little prediction for the weekend. But uh, I presumed you watched the the Grand Prix from Imola, and you saw how that went down. Uh, as I just said. It reminded me of the bloody boring races in the 2000s for a while. And I almost went, I went off to make a cup of tea, Dario, to come back to see Lando narrowing the gap. And I'm like, now we've got a motor race. Uh, how was your, what's your sort of quick overview of, of how it went? Yeah, very similar. Um, it's clear that the cars are too big now. Mm. They are just, I think they've got the, the aero package is not bad with all this underfloor. Um, downforce coming so they can follow, follow a bit closer but when you put them on an old traditional track like MLA you just see how fast they actually are now um, and I thought Max was going to run away with it yet again um, and Lando did the most phenomenal job didn't he it was great watching him coming through the chicane slide in the rear just absolutely fighting for every uh, fraction of a second but um, it, it goes back to just these two guys battling people keep saying oh anybody but max but you remember that max and and the red bull team have got hard work and i was in the bar at bahrain for the grand prix and watched trackside and max's level of ability is something very 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 mm. special 
Um, clearly the car is good. The team, you know, is is incredible. The, the John Wheatley tuned pit stops are, are are wonderful. But Max as a driver as well is is just like nothing I've ever seen. I mean, even Zach Brown said, "Oh, anyone could win in that car." Uh, not last weekend. No, not last weekend, right? No, no, I don't. I really don't believe that. But it's nice to see McLaren really challenging. And I think Lando has done such a good job and has stepped up. And then, of course, you've got Oscar Piastri in the second year. Um, a lot of good talent in F1, and it's so close just now. But again, I just would like in the new regulations to see a smaller, physically smaller car to uh, to allow these guys to to have more real estate to race on in, on mm. the, the different tracks. I agree. It's not that Emily yet. It is narrow, but the cars are. It's like. It's like they've almost melted, right? And they've spread out across the ground. And when they do, like on Instagram, you can see a, there's someone to do a great graphic between a Schumacher car and and now, and you go, holy cow. No wonder you're braking later. Yeah. You're going around the corners fast. You've got more tire technology and you're in something 30% bigger. As a as a driver, I mean, you've been there at, at that level. I know Formula One escaped you, unfortunately, but just... Ha- to put it in perspective for uh, our fans, what must it be like driving one of those cars at the absolute limit? Because as you said, Max turns it on. I watched here at the Indy, uh, the Vegas race, watching him come through in qualifying, that tangible difference between being 10 tenths and being nine tenths. In a Formula One car, you can feel, right? Like you could in Bahrain. What must it be like for them uh, on the pinnacle of, of physics, basically, in one of these cars? I think the the big thing with it, any car that produces that much downforce, that, that many g forces, is when the car slides when it gets away from you. You know this, Justin. When it gets away from you, the quicker the car, the more downforce, the quicker it snaps. And I was talking to Adrian Newey about it. Sorry about the name drop, yeah. but he um, he was explaining that Max feels the car slide, whether it's the front or the back or the whole car. He feels it slide almost before it's happened and that just gives him that ability to control the slip angle to push it that little fraction a bit more than anybody else they've seen and whether that's managing your tires or outright pace and what impressed me the most about max was he wasn't taking a lot out of the car either it was a very jackie stewart like drive that he looked like he was on a sunday drive but then you look at the stopwatch and he's just demolishing everybody so uh yeah again it's I, I really appreciate Max's talent and it was on full display there and it is frequently and it's sometimes frustrating when when you see um you know people saying oh anybody but those guys uh but you know as a race fan you want to see it mixed up and I think mm. I think we've definitely we're getting there aren't we with the the, the contenders coming in as our dear friend uh Gilles used to say when he was racing against people like you and Scott you were all total planks to him right i mean he admired you but his self-preservation was as a driver and was everyone's a tool right and and when he retired suddenly he was like oh they're really good it was that releasing being able to to acknowledge other people's talent without compromising your own competitiveness and she she was really funny when he'd talk about you guys until he'd stopped and then he was like oh he was bloody good uh what is it like I mean, you were the generational talent, but you had a lot of competition around you. So when you were on the high, you were on the high. And when you weren't, there was someone there straight away to to take that spot. As a driver, I mean, I know what it's like looking around the driver's room. You go, holy cow, if he's on form today, I'm in, I'm in the, you know, the toilet on this one. What's it like, do you think, mentally for those other Formula One drivers, not know, knowing he, Max has the best equipment, but also knowing that when he turns it on, they know from karting, he was just phenomenal. What's it like psychologically for them to deal with that? Yeah, I think it's it's very tough, isn't it? And different drivers go about things different ways. Different. Some guys think they're the absolute greatest in the world. They're the best. Nobody can beat them. Others go at it of a, with a more sort of negative thing. If I don't want to be beaten. There's a lot of psychological games that you play. But when you, when you go up against a talent like that, it's very difficult. Um, I think... I mean, Scott Dixon as a teammate, you know, week in, week out, that was a that was a test like I think none of I've, I've ever faced inside a team. Competing against Montoya in 1999, his rookie season in the target car, which at the time was the best car, 
and he would just turn it on and just think, how is he doing that? And those mm -hmm. days that you did beat him, you were like, you felt so good about it. Um, but it is a, uh, it's very, very difficult for those guys. I think the, you know, and these are some psychologically very strong people. They're very, um, you look at the, the, the list of names in F1 in the multi champions, you know, obviously starting with Lewis, um, but then you go down through Fernando as well. There's not many tougher people I think made than, than Fernando, but it's got to be difficult. Um, and I didn't really experience this that you get in Formula One where I've driven cars that were the best in the field. I've driven cars that weren't the best, but there was a small difference between them and you could at times make up for that. In F1, it's very, very difficult to, to close that gap. And if your team go around the wrong, down the wrong development curve, you're in all kinds of problems. And we've we've certainly seen that, I think, with uh, the Mercedes guys. We saw it maybe last weekend with Aston and in, in, in Imola. Yeah, it's very it's very tricky. My Jeremiah, my producer, was asking me earlier, what does it what do upgrades mean to a driver and how how do you how much involvement does the driver have? And then what's it like when you get to experience them for the first time? And I'm gonna ask you that from your point of view when it, Formula One is such a huge pyramid and the driver gives his input and then a, a, literally an army of engineers and very smart, smarter people than the driver mainly will then take that task on to improve the car. McLaren's upgrades have obviously been better than even they thought they were going to be. And the drivers have reacted. Can you give me a, what a feeling for what that must be like for like Lando and Oscar when they get in the car? Would they have known the minute they go out the pit lane? Like, geez, I think we're onto something. I think on the first lap, they would have. The first push lap, absolutely. I've experienced that with some of the, the sports cars I drove, um, where there was development gains of a second a lap. And you're not doing anything different in the car. Mm. You're driving the car the same bit. You're able to brake a fraction later, run off the, get off the brake pedal, carry more speed into the corner, get to the throttle earlier. And you look down and you look at your, your lap delta or you look at the end of a lap at your lap time and you just go, and it's just the best feeling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> it just feel, you feel like a hero and um you're not doing anything different so it and that again goes back to this you know all forms of racing especially f1 i think with the development cycles but racing is a is a team sport yeah and and to be in that window i mean you're dealing with it at the indy 500 to be in that performance window and we saw it during practice how can max's car beat the rebels be so bad on friday remark i mean he's going off and i'm thinking oh this is going to be good and then they work in the sim overnight, Sebastian Buemi, back at Red Bull's headquarters, and they come back with a setup the next day that obviously works, and he snatches pole. I have no experience at all, Dario, with the world of sims. I am useless on them. I've never driven on one of the big ones like you have. Can you give us a little insight into that performance window? What actually would have happened with Buemi on the sim and there, I know there's another driver involved what would have happened overnight just give us an idea of what you think that process would have looked like I, I'm kind of like you just, I, hate, I hate actually I enjoy playing with sims that have no motion when they get in the full motion ones I tend to throw up quite yeah. a lot um, but that could shows you that the, the level of teamwork again you know they've got these um, these ideas to, to improve the car and then you've got the correlation between the sim and real life and clearly very, very well for Red Bull and that they can go through all these um, ideas and find something they think works, put it on Max's car and, and Sergio's car and off they go. And it's, it, you know, I think that was again, the team doing that, but then it was Max, I think, figuring out as well, look, I can't, I want to drive this corner like this. I can't because if I do, I slide off the track. I have to back things up a bit and find the, the limit of the tire in the car. Um, over one lap and then over all the laps of the Grand Prix and that was um, that was bloody impressive I, I really watching that race I don't think the Red Bull was the, the best car mm. at the weekend um, qualifying really helped track position helped the crowd stops helped um, that all helped Max win, win that race yeah I mean anyway I, I think that you're right our generation we're so I mean who would have thought we'd have been considered old school and analog we thought we were cool as anything right but oh yeah but no these these guys i know the level of technology and communication that 
and familiarity with the environment, working environment that these Formula One drives drivers have to have. Uh, I mean, I used to struggle doing brake bias in the beginning. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, we've got to do it. They're changing things the whole time on the steering <laughs> wheel. It's constant. They're getting communication. Plan B, like Ferrari, we're going to plan F. You know, I mean, like, what the heck is that? I can't even remember anything during a race. They, do you think that the is exposure to simulators, video games, Max running the Nürburgring 24 hours on his sim during the weekend, it has to all be part of the way these young drivers have to drive a Formula One car compared to the way we would have done. Don't you think it's, it's, it's that oh, tangible absolutely. connection to technology? Absolutely right. And they're, as you say, they're constantly adjusting all kinds of things. There's paddle, there's more paddles and switches on the steering, and, and they they constantly are driving the car with one part of the brain, and then adjusting with others, feeling what the car's doing with another part of the brain. It, it's really really impressive, and I think F1 and probably World Endurance are the two greatest examples of of that of the technology involved. What the driver has to do, actually Formula E too, the Formula E cars, what the mm-hmm. drivers are doing there. All the information they're processing is quite uh, it's quite something. Um, IndyCar is, is during the, the qualifying, for instance, or the race uh, of the Indy 500, you'll see them adjusting their bars and the weight jacker in the car and engine maps in the short shoot between mm-hmm. turns one, two, and three and four. We used to do that uh, a bit. And trust me, you've, your brain's got to be working at absolutely full speed to, to be able to take all that information on board I said, in, in these short amounts of time. Did you ever test Formula One? I did. I uh, I tested for McLaren in '95, um, end of '95, and I it went really well actually. Um, so so well that in so well you didn't get a job. America, um, sorry. Well, I actually got offered a job. Ooh. Ron, I've still got the contract at home. Dear old Ron offered me a job, but I'd already gone to America, and it just didn't feel right. I was going to be the test driver there, um, but it was a very one-sided contract, and I didn't. It just didn't feel right. And then I um, tested the Jaguar in 2000, but that was just a whole... It wasn't a good uh, a good test. I was still injured from a, an accident I'd had at the start of 2000, both in terms of my body, but also I'd, I'd damaged my brain a lot. Um, and it was pretty clear that at the same time, they didn't really want somebody um, put on them by the, the, the Ford execs in America. So it it, it uh, that one didn't work out. But those those were the two chances, really. And um, yeah, so I I was talking about it the other day, and somebody said, "Oh, would you have given up? Would you have given up the IndyCar stuff for what you achieved? What would you, what you achieved in IndyCar for for a chance at F1?" And I always said no. But the one thing I missed, I think, was the chance to race at Silverstone uh... in my my home Grand Prix, and I really would love to have done that. But for me, racing was always about competing to win. And I was not interested in getting in an F1 car that I didn't feel I had a, at least a chance to show something. And to give up what I had in America would have been a big ask to get in the back of the grid, yeah. maybe mid-grid F1 car. And I wasn't prepared to take the gamble. No. Well, it's uh, even Mario back in the day, right? He knew he could make the real money here and and in, become an IndyCar star. And Formula One, yes, he was world champion. He's a pretty impressive guy. But there came a he point. Did okay. He did okay. Came a point. He couldn't afford it, uh, basically, to be that. That's really great. Well, if you could hold up your left hand and turn it around and show us the obnoxiously large ring that you have, uh, which was granted to you. Can you lift oh, that arm up? That's a small one. That's a small one? Okay. So you got that for which year? That one. This is the 2012 one. Um, the reason for that is the 2010 one no longer fits me. For everybody that's watching, watching, not listening, on. The, this is uh, this is he's showing us his Indy 500 ring, which is quite huge, by the way. Okay, so it doesn't fit you anymore because you're fat. The 2010 one doesn't. Okay. Yeah, and the 2007 one, um, I didn't get one from the team, so um, I wear the 2012 one. But um, as I point, I only wear this in the month of May when I'm in Indianapolis. And as I point out, everybody, at the team at Chip Ganassi Racing has one of these. So um, in a lot of cases, more than one. So they're quite common. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It makes me, it makes me proud to know you. It makes you remind. 12 years ago, though, mate, 12 years ago. 
I mean, that's time. Thanks, DB. Yeah, yeah decade, that. decade has moved on. But it is a huge weekend coming up. Let's, we've got two things to talk about quickly. Uh, any predictions for Monaco? And how, how important do you think qualifying is going to be? Bit of a rhetorical question, but it is going to be the show. Yeah, it, it's everything, isn't it? it um, unless you really mess up the, the strategy, qualifying is, is everything at Monaco now, and especially going back to our earlier discussion of the size of the cars. But that being said, it's not the easiest thing in the world to to thread the needle in an F1 car around Monaco with those big cars and not bounce the thing off the barrier. So um, I think it'll be a hell of a show, but I don't think there'll be a lot of overtaking, which will be the exact opposite of the Indy 500 later that afternoon. And later that afternoon, you're there, obviously, on the radio. Who, who will you be on the radio? Is Scott? So, no, no. Scott's got enough opinions on his timing stand. He's got our managing director, <laughs> Mike Hall. He's got yeah. Chip Ganassi. He's got our technical director, Chris Simmons. He's got his engineer. <laughs> he doesn't need, so, he doesn't need you as that. well. Yeah. No, he doesn't need another opinion. So I will, I will probably be on the 11 of Marcus Armstrong or the 8 of Linus Lundqvist. And just at that point, I'm, my job's done, really. There's times I'll say, look, he probably wants to hear that now. Let's, let's ask him this question. Let's tell him this. Um, otherwise, I let them really get on with it um, because the reason that the, we've got the strategists that we have and the engineers that we have is they know what they're doing. So, um, again, if I can be called on to help the, the, the rookies, I will. Um, and that uh, we had that a couple of years ago with Marcus Ericsson and the run down to the finish, basically trying to keep him calm oh, when, yeah. he, when one of the red flags came out. Um, so, Basically, any way I'm needed to to help one of our five cars increase their yeah. performance over the race, I'll uh, I'll be doing yeah. it. Keep Chip's blood pressure down during that whole thing. That's uh, that's always a, <laughs> a, a, t a task too. And I mean, and that is a task. It, so you got couldn't have two more contrasting events: the twisty turns of Monaco with the pomp and ceremony. There's a very similar but different level of pomp and ceremony at the Indy 500. Traditions, culture. Uh, I mean, it is the American motor race, one of the triple crown. It is also one of the single most dangerous things a, a man or woman can do behind the wheel of a car. And we tend to forget that. The speeds are mind numbing when they go to Indy. You're in traffic. Yet there's a middle part of the race when it is an endurance run to, to, for strategy. It's what, what should we look forward to? What should our, the, you know, drive to win fans look forward to? How, to see the race unfold? So the hardest bit at the, with the Indy right now, with the, the, the aero regulations, has become a track position race. That's kind of like Monaco. You want to be in that top three, four, maybe five. You go further back than fifth, then you are getting into really bad turbulence and it's very difficult to then start making, um, start making passes. So... You're going to see the start, the restarts. People are going to be taking risks like they generally wouldn't do in a in a 500 mile race to to kind of gain that track position. Then you're going to see some strategy during the race with with that as well. You know, in the pit stops, that's not a time to rest. That's a time to gain the slightest advantage that you possibly can. So it's it is really it's three hours of absolute flat out looking for that tiny tiny advantage, looking for the car ahead of you to make a mistake so you can jump them in traffic. Um, trying to balance the car on a knife edge at 230 miles an hour. And that is, I think that's the toughest part. You get in traffic and you've just, the car is just dancing around, moving. And then you've got to try and get up into the slipstream of the car in front. And the closer you get to the car in front, in the middle of a corner, the more you, you, you lose grip. And it is, you know, I've driven car, different types of cars all over the world, all different types of tracks. And this to me is the ultimate tightrope. Um, that these guys are walking on and these drivers are are doing and so it's, it's one of those things when you're doing it it feels normal and i remember you've been qualifying back in the car you're back into the car sliding into turn one it and you're showing 240 miles an hour and um it felt normal now i watch them do it and i'm literally covering my eyes oh. it's just <laughs> it's nuts it's that's the way i always thought that i remember at le mans i went out onto the Mulsanne watch in we went we had a problem so i went out it was one of my first le mans and i you shouldn't do that kind of thing you shouldn't go and watch cars at full speed if you're about to get in one because it looks a lot bloody quicker when you're standing by the guardrail <laughs> you're like what are they lunatics but you're right when you're in it you only see the cars around you don't you you don't see the 
the entire field. Yeah, you only see that you're X slower than the car in front. And if you, all of a sudden you feel you're going slowly because the guy in front's pulling away. I remember uh, talking about our great friend Jill the first time I went to an oval track and I walked out. I was about to, I was waiting on the car getting, getting ready for the, the session. I walked out and I'm watching and Jill's going round at Homestead. And I thought he's going to past he goes he's got this I've been quicker than that that's fine that doesn't look that quick what I didn't realize was he was actually bedding his brakes in and the first lap that he went past at full noise I literally wanted to pack my bags jump on the next BA flight and head home yeah I mean uh, God rest him his little soul well not so little actually a rather big round one but yeah they're going to do a nice tribute to him this weekend I hear they're going to run his car at the front of the field they are. Uh, Simon Pagano is going to drive his car, um, which is his Indy winning car, which is just wonderful. Yeah. It's so, so nice to to see him being recognised, as he should be. I mean, yeah. he's a giant of, of motorsport and especially of IndyCar and an Indianapolis 500 winner as well as a champion. So um, he's driving, yeah, Simon's going to drive Gilles' car. I'll, I'm driving Jimmy Clark's 64 car in the, wow. in the pre-race parade. Yeah. Um, but I cannot wait to to see Gilles' car. That'll be, but that will be tough because normally in the, as we used to call it, the old guys parade, um, and the, the past winners would go out in their cars and, and wave to the crowd and everything. And Gilles, Angela, Luke, and Anna would always be in the car in front of us. So Ugh. I'm a senior big head this year. Yeah. Well. It's time for the Mobile One pit stop for the love of driving. Dario, you almost answered this first question, but we'll kick it off. Which of your major wins would you give up, sacrifice to have one Formula One win? Phew, are you talking about giving up an Indy 500 win? Well, I think I am. You've got enough. Would you do it? Nah. <laughs> nah. Okay. Uh, which, <laughs> which current Indy car driver would you put in a Formula One car? I would still put the old guy Scott Dixon in there. Um, yeah, what a what a talent. Um, yeah, Scott Dixon. Why are you Scots for north of Hadrian's Wall quite so good at racing? We were lucky. We got to lead by we got led by example. Jim Clark, Jackie Stewart, David Leslie. Um, I got to follow Alan. McNish, David Coulthard, we got to lead, we got to follow the, the, those examples. And I think that was why. And then, of course, you've got the McRae family in rallying. Um, we were very, very fortunate. We, we went through a real, a really good run. And I hope we can get more Scottish talent coming up through um, in years to come. Is social media a good or a bad thing for the modern day driver? Ooh, both. <laughs> both. I think it. I think it can be a wonderful way to connect with um, with fans, um, people that share passions. My my one. If you look at my social media, it's all about cars. Um, but and also my family and, and connecting with friends throughout the world. So I think from that point of view, it's really good. But there is obviously no a tremendously negative side to it as well. So Jim Clark is your hero. I know you you're such a collector of his stuff, but. Even him with his outrageous, legendary levels of talent, what do you think he would say in that broad accent if you dropped him right now into a modern-day Formula One car? He'd probably say, she's pretty quick. <laughs> I think he, you know, he never really drove with downforce, did he? It's no. not something he experienced. Um, I think that would probably catch him by surprise for the first little bit, and then the brain would... The brain would take over, the instinct would take over, and he'd find a way to make it go around the track quicker than the other guys, as he as he always did. As he always did. Final question: When you when you were there in the drivers briefing, looking around, I've asked this of Mario and everybody. Who was the guy that you looked at and went, "That's that's the guy to beat today"? Who was your nemesis? It depended on the. It depended really on the on the race on the how the form book looked before every single one of them at Indy. Um, and I, I didn't honestly drivers briefing. I saw nothing. I just, I was already in my zone and 
I didn't see the crowd. I didn't see the opposition. Um, and I maybe went about it slightly differently than, than other drivers. I was racing myself and I was maximizing everything I had that day. And it was about me competing with myself more than the others. And um, so I was, I, what they were going to do, what they could do, really, I didn't worry so much about it. I just maximized my own, uh, my own car, my own team. And uh, yeah, tried to win the bloody. Which is why you are a multiple champion and not me. Anyway, Dario, thank you so much. I, I'm looking forward to. I'll be there on at the weekend with Tag Heuer. I'm gonna have. A, I'm gonna do a VIP experience. So uh, I'm just gonna be enjoying. Well, you are it. a VIP. Well, I'm pretty not useful there for any other reason other than looking good and talking to everyone. So it's gonna be great fun. I will see you there at the weekend, my friend. Thank you so much for being on the show. It it was really interesting. Thank you for having me. Well, really nice. All right, buddy. Take care. You don't need to go 200 miles an hour to outrun your inbox or pull multiple Gs around corners just to decline a phone call. You don't have someone waving a yellow flag to tell you to slow down and look around. Basically, what I'm trying to say is you don't need to be a professional race car driver to disconnect and break free. All you have to do is drive. Mobile One, for the love of driving. Visit loveofdriving.us slash drive to win to learn some more. Well, as you can see, everything, as always, is happening here at The Win as we gear up, not just for Ultimate Race Week. We've got the Concours. And this weekend with Monaco and the Indy 500, there's a lot to talk about. I can't wait till next week's show. So what about Monaco this weekend? Well, we heard it from Dario. It's going to be all about qualifying. And I urge you not to miss that because seeing how everyone, the the native, the only Monegasque is Charles Leclerc. He's spectacular around one lap and definitely will be able to unleash himself on the track this weekend at his home race. I really do predict that I think it will be a Ferrari opportunity to be on the front row and maybe a win. Track position will be everything. But do you remember that lap that Max did in qualifying last year? It was mesmerizing. You see, Jeremiah, I did quote you. Mesmerizing uh, to watch. Uh, and that was like, it reminded me of going back to Ayrton Senna's literally extraordinary, legendary lap round there in qualifying all those years ago. So, But the question is, what if he has a poor time in practice again? We know he doesn't like running his car high with the bumps and those curbs through the marina and the swimming pool complex. I mean, Monaco, is, as Dario said, is about threading the needle. So let's just see. I would love, hate to say it, Max, but I would love to see you not on front row because your starts are way too good. Uh, McLaren, both their guys can get pole, and I think that's setting up for a great showdown. Those last few minutes and the timing of getting out and not getting in traffic, one car will absolutely destroy your qualifying lap and therefore you won't win. Um, so I think that's going to be great with their upgrades are going to come into their own. Talking about upgrades, Ferrari, the, those two drivers uh, both love the track, both have got the upgrades, and I think it's going to be very, very special. And Mercedes, well, we didn't even mention them, this show. They ran around sort of mid-top 10 in Imola, and uh, I don't really see them being a huge player this weekend. But so for me, the message is do not miss qualifying for the Monaco Grand Prix. I'll be back next week. Uh, I cannot wait. Our guest is Gunter Steiner. Yeah, he is the big, uh, legendary, uh, polarizing figure from Drive to Survive, obviously released from the Haas team and now making his way as a commentator, a, a writer. And as he told me on the phone last week when we set it up, he is busier than he ever has been before. So I can't wait to find out more about that. And we'll probably have to bleep every other word, which suits me because I'm British because I talk like that. Except on this show. Anyway, everyone, have a great weekend. Enjoy lots of racing to watch on the Sunday. This is it for Drive to Win here from the Win Las Vegas. A big thanks to them for their continued support. And of course, to Mobile One for the love of driving. Enjoy your weekend.